welcome <coughs> to this video round six coverage of the norway chess tournament yeah let's get right into the action looking at the first couple of games we're starting with aronia against giri um yeah a match of two players um with very different um experiences than round before aronia lost this long battle against uh, Karls and very disappointing after he had a very good position while Giri had won against Topalov in a somewhat lucky manner being lost um, quite clearly at one point and then in, in fact he uh, in, instead he won the game yeah we have this um, symmetrical English here with e3 the same line that Carlson had played against Giri in the in the very first round and um, yeah, now Giri is playing differently. In the very first round, he had played on um, the capture, and then g6. I think why did he did he start with queen c7? No, it was this kind of setup at least, somewhat Grunfeldish, let's say. Um, this time after e3, he had uh, played e6 completely differently, and um, with this, we transpose to a position that normally arises from the Queen's Gambit uh, semi tarash And um, it's um, an isolated Queen Pawn position, a very typical one. In fact, I always thought that uh, White should have a little something here, being the more active um, in the center. But um, the way Giri played this here with b6, I thought was really convincing. If we uh, look at this just a couple of moves later, and all this seems very normal. I think um, around here, Black already has a fairly comfortable position. It's not um, like he's better or anything, but I think Black can be very satisfied with the whole thing. I watched some minutes of the press conference and uh, they both agree that Black's opening result was uh, quite nice. Knight g6, a very interesting idea, trying to Get to the f4 square and it's not so easy for white uh, to avoid this g3 move you don't really want something to pop up on f4 but g3 is not a move you love to play with the bishop on c4 yeah, not this <laughs> the bishop on c4 it always seems kind of weak the white uh, position yeah h4 and now knight f6 played challenging the knight and white has no real choice he needs yeah. to trade it and the more pieces are being traded here, the simpler it becomes for Black to play the position. Around here, I think Aronian already was in, in damage control mode, not um, getting um, yeah, in trouble too much. He um, decided to trade things off and then Queen d6 was played. Quite an inconvenient move to face. But quite strong. Black now is almost by force winning a pawn. Bishop b7, bishop e5, and white cannot really save the d pawn. It um, came to this with black just being a pawn up. But um, the good thing is we have opposite colored bishops. And um, this, in fact, should secure the draw for white. We see that the whole queen side is traded. And here, four against three with this opposite colored bishops is um, a pretty easy win, especially cons uh, easy win, <laughs> easy draw, <laughs> of course, um, especially considering that um, black is not managing to activate his forces. If we imagine a position, though, theoretically speaking, a pawn on e5 and a bishop on d4, then the rook entering, putting pressure on the pawn here this kind of fantasy variation this would be nice for black but you never get there as white is uh, is active and he can always um, with rook on c8 um, basically keep the bishop here as um, a bishop move would allow the rook trade and after rook trades it's totally dead yeah check. they they shuffled check. a bit check but, um, there is Check. simply nothing going on and here they agree to a draw yeah very unspectacular game where um, it just seemed that um, Aronian was caught wrong-footed in the opening in a way um, it does not seem 
like um, all this is uh, is giving white that much. A bit surprising in uh, in my book. I mean, bishop d3 is um, the somewhat slightly more popular um, option here, but um, leading to a same a similar position, but with the bishop here. But still, I thought this would be a very serious way for for white to try to play for an edge, but it does not really appear to be uh, that promising. Okay, the next move is. Um, that I'm going to look is Akstein, Akstein. I'm somehow having trouble with his name against um, Caruana, and um, Caruana had lost in the last round. This um, this weird game against Kromnik where it was basically a very drawish end game, and then he made a very simple mistake. Yeah, today we see right from move one, d6 is sort of telling the other guy, okay, I want to beat you. <laughs> And this, at least on this level, it's uh, quite a serious message that it uh, is, a, is it is um, a game that Black wants to win. He's uh, offering um, the Pirks, uh, Pirks defense with e4 or modern, but Akstein is not going for that. He's playing a very solid setup with g3. And, um, c5 played. Yeah, Black wants out of the, the, the long theoretical lines and play a somewhat asymmetrical game. Also, um, senior with queen b6 directly attacking the knight. But uh, white finds a nice reply. He just plays bishop e3, offering the b2 pawn. Yeah, can black take the pawn? It always needs to be checked. Yeah, white, um, of course, being attacked now on a1, he needs to play knight e2. It has a very nice development now. I think the whole business is very risky for black. White has got everything out. And of course, this is not possible. I'm sorry, then a1 hangs. First, you need to play rook here. Something like that is terrible for black. Yeah, he didn't take it. He played queen to a5, getting out of uh, the discovery with the knight. And now... Um, in a keep it simple manner, queen d2 played. Yeah, a trade. And uh, black now playing a6 to prevent knight b5. The whole thing looks nice for white. He's got uh, very much better development. But white has one uh, one problem in the position. This is a knight on d2. If the knight would be on c3, it could easily jump right into the thick of things and uh, guarantee white um, some play. But um, in, in this position, it's not so easy to uh, to make any headway. And e5 was, I think, a, a strong move. It uh, got rid of the central knight. And um, the d6 pawn is not really a serious weakness, as white is absolutely uh, yeah, not coordinated to attack the pawn. The bishop on e3, for example, is far away from attacking it. Um, so we got this this type of position here, where after long castles, I think black is uh, is uh, certainly okay. The question is, however, what happens after knight e4? At first, it seems that this is a very very awkward pin, but black has an interesting tactical solution. He takes on e4, bishop d8, and now takes on e2. It's quite funny this kind of desperado knight, which secures that black is getting at least a pawn for the exchange. White took here, took on d8. And now black has sacrificed the exchange for a pawn, but he also has uh, some other advantages. He's very sound pawn structure. Two pawn islands against um, three pawn, pawn islands on the white side. White has numerous somewhat weak pawns, and white is not terribly well coordinated, especially the knight on d3 is misplaced. So I guess black has um, a full compensation for, for the material. Bishop d5 was played, exchanging um, the, the bishop or initiating this trade Down around here. We um, get to this position where still Black um, enjoys very substantial compensation for the um, for the exchange. It's only a question if Black can um, 
can uh, make any any serious headway. It's uh, not totally apparent to me in the course of the game, the curse and the course of the game, the curse of the game doesn't sound right. Um, um, where Black could have um, done much better than than what uh, than what he played. Yeah, this sounds uh, or this looks uh, fairly logical, but White now gets the knight activated, and um, also this trade in. It's uh, very difficult to uh, to get anything substantial. Yes, White has the the pawns that he uh, that he can attack in the game. Check. We had those trades, and it's clear that Black has a fine position. But uh, can you really? win the game very uh, very difficult i think white has a very serious blockade Check. now on the light squares it's very difficult to to get the pawn moving for example the e3 pawn or the h pawn for that matter and with a4 b5 white has managed to uh, to activate his uh, his rooks um in fact only a couple of moves later exactly here they agree to a draw the simple fact being that rook f7, which wasn't played out, but uh, rook f7, rook d5, and then uh, the capture, both captures actually, but this Check. kind of stuff, leads to a position where um, black has absolutely no uh, no winning chances. White can also take with this Check. and um, can give a perpetual here. Check. Or let's say black can try to Check. get there, but... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, ultimately there is no way forward for black. So it is the f uh, the fifth draw for Akterstein. Uh, sorry, the sixth draw. Um, that's really a, an accomplishment. Yeah, I don't think many players or many experts, whatever, would have uh, guessed that he is managing to hold his own uh, so well here. And. Um, the draw for Caruana certainly not great. He um, certainly imagined that with a win he could um, get back into the race, but um, it didn't. It didn't happen. Um, the next game is um, Kayakin against Carlsen, and um, yeah, I must admit that this game is um, some sort of preparation mystery to me, and. Uh, I, I I must confess that probably this is a case where I simply don't understand uh, chess well enough to 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 understand what's going on. Um, we have the Berlin, which is pretty much, um, yeah, it's not happening all the time with Carlsen playing black against e4, but he's playing it very very often, so it's easily anticipated by Kayakin. All this has been played. Yeah, this um, idea with quick h3 is, uh, is is commonly known. And if we look into the database, yeah, we see a game from last year. Um, Linier Dominguez, the top Cuban player, against David Navarra from uh, from the Czech Republic. They had exactly the same thing on the board. H6 takes on f7, rook e8. At first, this looks funny. Yeah? Black gives up the pawn, but the knight has no way back. And um, feed this to to any any decent engine, it it gives exactly this position. Black is going to play bishop e6. This is the novelty. Rook f8 was played in the Navarra game, but bishop e6 is also the move that any computer here gives, and it's a totally forcing sequence. Now, knight takes h6. The knight has no square, and then f5. All oh, this looks funny and interesting. Yeah, three pawns. Isn't this exciting? It could be exciting if Black um, would try to hang on to the bishop, which, of course, if you look at it only briefly with the engine, it's very apparent that Black shouldn't try something like that. For example, yeah, misplacing his bishop like that. Then this is totally dangerous. Those those kind of pawns uh, will roll. But the computer just gives this and this and t tells it dead equal. And I mean, what exactly is Kayakin's idea of a preparation here? He repeats um, 18 moves of known theory and then plays a totally harmless... Uh, this is totally harmless. I mean, Carlsen is just drawing this uh, in his Check. sleep. And 
um, I mean, look at the time spent. I mean, this is uh, like absolutely no Check. effort for the world Check. champion. Check. Yeah, and here they, about here, they go to a draw. Check. Black, um, Black has just uh, the active Check. rook here and uh, checks till uh, hell freezes over. I don't understand some kind, some of those games, unless uh, Kayakin was really uh, basically resigned to a draw from, from the outset. But you know that this is coming on the board and uh, is he really thinking that Carlton is not finding this stuff? I mean, I mean, sorry, I would find this stuff. And the world Check. champion, uh, I mean, really in his sleep, yeah. Um, I really don't know what, what this kind of preparation um, is all about. I mean, if white is so desperate uh, in the in the Berlin, you should simply play some other opening. I mean, play the Italian game or I don't know. There, there must be some other stuff that can be tried. Or play the ultimate anti Berlin, 1d4 or c4 or whatever. But I mean, this is uh, it's really uh, not really a game of chess. Uh, if you play this against a well-prepared player, it will just end in a draw quite instantly. So kind of a non-game here. The next game is um, the Swidler game. Grishuk against Swidler. Yeah, two friends playing each other. And um, we get the same opening that we had seen before. This is quite uh, quite a trend in, in top level chess. This uh, this line, and I think uh, there is one reason for that. It is very often played uh, by black players who like the Grunfeld. It is somewhat Grunfeldish this idea with the d5, but uh, they don't want to play the to the 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 usual anti Grunfeld. Yeah, what I'm talking about is this was, of course very uh, popular for a very long time but here white has a number of things that he can try queen a4 check the capture and queen a4 check. yeah queen b3 whatever and it seems the trend is shifting towards playing this line which sometimes can transpose for instance if white goes d4 something like that can easily transpose to a grunfeld or to a very grunfeld like position here with e3 and there are some other lines, of course, that white can try, independent lines. E3 we had seen in Aronian um, um, against uh, Giri and um, Carlsen Giri. And one point of this move, by the way, is that g6, queen b3 is quite nice for white, as the capture after queen c3 is, is fairly ugly for black. Not nice. Black also has to play a very ugly move now, like f6, and after that, he's just not very well placed. Yeah, well, okay, here e4 was played. Another interesting continuation, which incidentally is what, what I have played in this position a number of times with white. Knight b4 must be played, must be uh, active here. This is not so great. This, this type of queenless middle game is quite nice for white. King gets not there. Nicely to c2 and c5 is not really well placed. Yeah, knight b4 is normal getting for this play. And now check. the check was given. Bishop c4 is also interesting. This, yeah, and in this position in former times, it was almost uh, mandatory to play one d uh, to play d4 here with uh, this kind of continuation leading to sharp play, which however, yeah, even like 15 to 20 years ago, was believed to be totally equal. Um, D3 now played by Grishok, an interesting idea. This has a um, completely different um, setup in mind. Check. We uh, get to this after E5, we see a position where white does not have a super attractive structure. It's not so clear what he's doing with this, but he's very well developed and has a concrete idea in mind. Exactly here, after b6 is played, yeah, Swidler wants to give the pawn here very um, reliable protection, b6. Um, yeah, here White has an interesting idea played by Grishuk, the move b4. And if you look at the, the time span, this was certainly a prepared prepared move. Knight takes b4 and knight takes e5. And fun trade of b against e pawn. 
note that the pawn capture after knight d5 is um, not very attractive for black as this threat and rook takes c6 yeah black must play something like that which really looks very unattractive yeah this was played and this is not bad for black bishop d6 gains some time and this uh, this funny trade happened yeah a very unconventional position but it seems that at least for Grishuk all this was known he kept playing quickly what Swidler was thinking and um, yeah the whole thing is I guess uh, despite being uh, totally um, yeah uh, non-symmetrical is probably relatively um, balanced this position black has um, active player with his bishops but he must be careful. White has a very nice center and a good knight on d5. However, this is also an interesting uh, factor of the position, the, the pass pawns on the queen side. At the moment, however, they don't, um, they don't move quickly forward. So it's not a direct threat. Yeah, all this looks fairly logical. I guess white trading uh, queens here and now we have a very concrete sequence with bishop e2 yeah around here maybe it is possible to to look for a white um, a white advantage but i really didn't i really didn't found any find anything substantial also um the computer um, didn't didn't find much here it looks um it looks quite nice for white with rook f5 white has the activity but uh, but how do you actually um, get make any headway? He took on b4. Maybe it was more interesting to try the move d for him, kicking the the bishop back. The whole thing, however, is very complicated. If we consider bishop d6, rook c6, you know, it can easily happen that uh, black can uh, can use the b pawn in connection with um, Check. this activity. How is white stopping the b-pawn now? This uh, will prove very difficult. It is a tricky position. Um, yeah, well, Grishuk took on b4. He played this really quickly. Maybe he for once uh, decided to not get into time trouble. Yeah, and um, in fact here, the whole thing has uh, pretty much traded down to a total equality. Check. Yeah, and here Check. after this back and forth business, they agree to a draw. Yeah, white has an extra pawn even here, but uh, a totally worthless one. Black has the A pawn as a compensation, so there is absolutely uh, no way forward. Yeah, again, a very um, um, unspectacular game. So, um, what about this round? Isn't it a bit dull? It is a bit dull. There was one um, remarkable game, however, and this is the one I'm going to cover as the game of the day. This is Topalov playing Kromnik. Yeah, of course, those two players have a history. The, <clears throat> the Elishta match in 2006 with uh, the toilet gate scandal and whatever. So... <clears throat> they still don't uh, shake each other's hands and so on. They don't do press conferences together. So uh, it is um, it is more than a game for those two. To pile off here with the white pieces, he allows the Nimzo and um, now chooses knight f3. Yeah, in fact, um, the the Nimzo is um, allowing the Nimzo for in a way for white is. Um, as I believe the way forward, if you want to to get a battle, yeah, it uh, it is pretty clear that you get it on the board. As after knight f6 e6, black is not going to play the queen's gambit decline anymore. The nimzo is the the opening of choice, and here you can select from a wide range of possibilities where you can try to set black problems. Of course, black is totally fine. The nimzo is probably the soundest opening there is in chess. But um, what I'm saying is white. Being able to uh, to to predict that it's coming on the board can choose some some weapon of choice, so to say. Yeah, knight f3. 
sometimes called the Kasparov variation. Especially this is attributed to Kasparov as he had played it um, in the 1986 match against Karpov with lots of success. Kramnik is not playing c5 this time, however, which is his normal move. Um, curiously enough, he plays castles here. And uh, while this doesn't have a bad reputation, it does not have the most... Uh, yeah, it's not a super established line, as White now manages to set up this pin. And this is... Um, yeah, it's not so clear if Black has anything better now than transposing into this kind of Rogozin setup. He tried though with c5, a known uh, continuation, of course. And now this was played, and d5. Yeah, the thing why, why I'm looking at this opening a bit is that uh, rather quickly we get a crisis in this game. White now played bishop f6, queen f6, took on d5. Very interesting um, situation now. Um, Kromnik here can play the the simple move. We're, we're already, by the way, um, out of uh, established uh, theory. This hasn't been played before, at least not in, in my not too small database. Um, yeah, uh, Kromnik plays rook d8. So um, going for some tactically inclined um, way. He also could have taken on d5, and I don't really think that this has some some huge uh, problem attached to it. It is an isolated pawn, that's true, but black also gets very easy development. If we consider, for example, e3, the most obvious move, I guess. Yeah, white does not have the time to, to do something like this here. Yeah, this is immediately leading into trouble with d4. Black is better developed in this position. So e3 must must be played. And then knight c6. I mean, I really don't think that this should be anything great for white. No, I mean, black is, is very, very close to, to, to total equality. Yeah, let's say bishop e2. And if I really don't, uh, don't um, find anything better, I'm just doing this. And I really don't see Kromnik losing this position ever against anyone. <laughs> it's just uh, totally sound for Black. You can even argue that he's uh, better here. Um, not a forced line, of course, but I'm just saying that he could have played ed5 with a simple and, and good game, I believe. Rook d8, as mentioned, e3. Now e takes d5 is not as pointed and it's not clear that the rook belongs on d8. But anyway, it was clear he wanted to do this. Yeah, giving, making some sense of the rook d8 move. And now queen b3. Yeah, this is a really a curious uh, situation now. Um, yeah, here um, Kromnik basically has a choice. He can admit that the whole thing is not leading too much and play um, some... Yeah, not very inspiring move, like taking, Check. for example, and then go back. This is not as stupid as it looks. I mean, it looks, yeah, like like a meek continuation, but um, it is not that terrible. I mean, if we look at this, bishop e2, bishop d7, and knight c6 coming, this is not a terrible position for black. Maybe the issue that he had was that queen c8 is a possibility. Could, uh, could be the case. Check. This is uh, an interesting continuation for white. Mm -hmm. Looking at this pawn. Yeah, but black should be okay here. Bishop b7. And... Um, White's pieces don't have any any good coordination. This, this or this coming. Um, I mean, it was possible to play in this way. It, however, is probably not a continuation that Kromnik wants to play against his uh, his uh, yeah no, uh, enemy number one, so to say, being uh, this uh, in this sort of yeah, setting up this sort of uh, passive defense. He decided to sacrifice the exchange on d4. 
And uh, well, to be honest, I don't really think that this is uh, this is totally sound. Takes, of course, and knight c6. We see black's idea. He will get this d4 pawn. That's pretty much clear. And then he will have a pawn for the exchange. But the question is, is it really enough? Let's look at the game. Bishop, bishop b5. Queen f4. This is necessary to get the pawn at all. Castles. Knight d4. And queen to d1. This is pretty much forced. And uh, the, the problem, in a way, is that black has got the pawn. He's got two bishops. He's got uh, a possibility to uh, to even anchor his knight in the middle of the board. But um, still, he's not very well developed. This is a big problem. The bishop is on c8 and the rook is on a8. They don't play. And um, black really has to make some concessions to get those pieces into the game. Um, here, he, at the end, decided to take on c3. And I think after that, it is very clear that this is an insufficient uh, sacrifice that he made. Maybe still bishop a5 needed to be tried, trying to <clears throat> play the bishop to b6. But it still stays um, on c8, the other bishop. Yeah, uh, I cannot really believe that this is enough for the exchange. It's not like totally off, but um, it, it it seems to favor white, I believe. After the capture, we pretty quickly see that it is insufficient. Rook takes and e5. Yeah, getting the bishop out. Bishop c4. Looking at this diagonal, maybe intending bishop d5. Bishop d7, queen c1 trying to exchange queens okay this was avoided and now the queen has a nice post on e3 and now we see a very important maneuver after bishop c6 the only sensible place for the bishop white regroups and this is a very strong regrouping the bishop to e4 very simple but very strong yeah it identifying that the bishop on c6 is a very strong piece White tries to exchange this piece. Of course, the d4 knight is also very strong. Certainly the, the best piece that black has, but of course you cannot exchange it easily. You would need a rook for that and you don't want to return the exchange. After this, this uh, bishop d3 e4 maneuver, these uh, pieces get traded or black loses coordination and this is what happens. And now white enters on the seventh rank. Yeah, around here the position um, enters um, the, 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 yeah, it, it's a winning position now for white. Black um, can only try to, to muddy the waters. Took on b2, uh, on a2, sorry, white takes on b7. Now a6 was played. Yeah, note that queen takes after rook b1 wasn't really great too much on the bishop yeah a6 and now b3 yeah and b3 is quite a nice move it uh, makes sure that this um, diagonal is blocked and white now intends to yeah, drawing bad arrows here intends to put the bishop on d5 and get this pressure on f7 going which would be um, absolutely overwhelming yeah, black um, really has no defense. The The only thing is uh, the way that Kromnik played it, it was a tad embarrassing because he played rook d8 and uh, there was still bishop d5. <laughs> I mean, he really didn't have a good move, but bishop rook d8 is just somewhat funny as it looks like it prevents bishop d5, but it's of course still playable as uh, black cannot really capture due to Check. b8 king h7 Check. queen a4 and the rook is falling yeah Check. so bishop d5 was played yeah and now black is uh, is really in dire straits f7 is also gone now he check. tried it with um, the check and knight f4 yeah and okay check. white just white just takes this 
Now queen b6 was played. Yeah, this is uh, not the most precise move. It seems if you ask our silicon friend here, it gives rook b6. It looks a tad mysterious at first. What is this doing? But um, if you look at it um, in a bit more detail, you, you see the point. One important point is that it, it, in a way, keeps the knight on f4. The knight cannot move. After knight e2, for example, white check. will very quickly checkmate. spot this checkmate. Quite um, quite a sudden, a sudden end to the game if the knight would move. Rook b6 was very strong. Knight b6, uh, uh, queen b6 also looks good. It attacks the rook and everything, but it is not as convincing. We see that after queen d1, rook g1, this was necessary. Rook was attacked and it didn't have any other square to go to. That black here could have played, but he didn't. He could have played a continuation that still would have uh, put up some resistance. And this is knight to h3. Looks funny, but it has an idea. After the capture, there is bishop e2. And bishop f3 check <clears throat> is a very substantial substantial threat. In fact, this is so substantial. After queen c6, queen d3, renewing the threat, white must play bishop d5. And um, check. yeah, well, this position here is still winning for white. But um, yeah, he can continue. It's not so easy. White is um, not easily winning the a-pawn as it is anchored here. It is protected by the bishop and white's pawn structure is very wrecked. White should win, but uh, this was some way to continue. Kromnik played king h7. Maybe he saw it and, and, and said, okay, this is winning uh, for white anyway. And um, well, there, there, there really isn't um, any great continuation h3 the kind of keep it safe move not doing anything fancy white is of course clearly up in material and uh, it's also just attacking black without any um, any uh, need for fancy play there, there were more direct ways to play rook b8 for example also very effective but uh, this was just um, just okay it keeps the win and uh, does not make it uh, difficult yeah, queen c7, looking at the square on g7, like bishop g8 check. Yeah, that was the only way to continue. But um, black is, of course, check. totally busted. Check. He check. took this uh, walk with the king all the way to f5, probably too disgusted to, uh, to resign. Now bishop h5. Little tactical stroke after this. Check. White regains the material and is of course completely winning. Yeah, it only. Um... Oh, this was played actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't really know that it was played. Check. I actually had stopped my analysis Check. a couple of moves earlier because I, was th I, s I thought, okay, it's totally winning. No need to prepare anything on that. Yeah, and here. Here Kromnik, uh, Kromnik uh, resigned the game and he was, uh, as, as I read, uh, totally frustrated and, uh, and left the whole, the whole venue <laughs> without, uh, I think, even showing up at the press conference. I'm not quite sure about that, don't want to tell anything wrong, but uh, it, it, it seemed that he was uh, really, really, um, <clears throat> really very angry at himself, I guess, for, for this game. Yeah, especially uh, losing this like that is no not fun at all, and doing this against his uh, nemesis is certainly uh, certainly terrible. Um, still tough to understand uh, in a way. I mean, right here, maybe he thought that rook d5 was actually yeah an enterprising continuation that uh, gives him better chances even. Um, but he takes d5 and um, and the knight c6 was very solid way to play and I don't really see any big drawback um, especially before rook d8 was played of course so around around here yeah I mean you we can look at this further but something like that for example is simply not uh, not great for white because of the development the king side is still 
is still not uh, not out and um, yeah, something like that I don't really know uh, but this this looks fine to me black is very active and um, yeah something like this bishop g4 he's got everything all pieces are in play and uh, black should be totally okay here so I'm I'm a bit mystified why uh, why he didn't go for that maybe he just overestimated his chances with rook d8 rook d5 it looks active at first but uh, it does not really seem to um, to to work out as uh, as planned so after this round we have uh, the funny situation that we have three players leading the tournament with a somewhat meager plus one score Caruana still of course Kramnik after this loss down to plus one and Carlsen the world champion also on plus one so it is wide open even the guys on 50% can still win it of course um, it's um, a, a wide open race now every everybody almost um, has has chances yeah okay I hope you enjoyed the coverage of the sixth round it wasn't the most uh, exciting round but um, still some some interesting uh, points to uh, to enjoy in the games I think we have a round seven um, tomorrow the rest days only after the seventh round so looking forward to cover this uh, upcoming round tomorrow thanks for watching and I'll be back with round seven coverage bye